I've been arrested, verbally insulted, picked up from a wall I was painting in broad daylight to be driven to a police station and be interrogated several times. My business partner Andrew has been physically assaulted by a person of official authority, and galleries as well as art institutions that chose to exhibit my work had at times to deal with, let's call it, professional inconveniences. And all this because I use spray paint as my medium, even though I choose to do so legally and community-oriented. Over the years, I've experienced a great deal of interest towards spray painting as an art form, but also a lot of prejudices against this form of expression, something that I refer to as aerosol art. Most of these misconceptions about aerosol art exist because of a lack of a deeper understanding about its parent art form, graffiti. I began calling myself an aerosol artist rather than a graffiti artist to emphasize my legal and community-based approach to spray painting. But I do love graffiti, and originally coming from that movement, I deeply appreciate its rich and rebellious history and visual beauty and its powerful non-monetary motivations. So rather than denying graffiti, Andy and I would like to offer an additional graffiti-inspired appendage that focuses on community building and art education. Everything to do with a spray can continues to be polarizing, and the, the appreciation of sprayed art varies greatly. It always seems to matter a lot less what the image is about than the fact that it is spray-painted. So on the one hand, Andy and I have seen our commissioned works disassembled in the middle of the night without permission by real estate developers out of fear it would decrease property values in the area. And on the other hand, it is widely used throughout communities to revitalize them and beautify them all over the world. Some can't deal with the lack of formality and expect an engraved silver plate next to it much unlike the gang members who hugged me with tears in their eyes after I painted the name of their friend on the building of a street corner where he had died. They did not want that engraved silver plate, but rather a tag from a spray can to commemorate their friend. The varying associations of legality or lack thereof are vastly different. Once working with kids at Reiki School in Portland, this young girl who had just finished cutting her stencil and was excited to try it out approached us to give her a spray can, and we gave it to her along with a big white piece of paper and sent outside so she wouldn't fume up the room. And a couple of minutes later, she returns wearing a big smile and carrying a big white piece of paper. <laughs> so Andy and I approached her and asked, did you have any problems with the cans? And she's like, oh, no, it went great. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we look at each other and rush outside and realize she had spray painted her image directly onto the concrete next to the entrance. Like most kids, seeing it all over the community and in her city, she didn't make any associations with illegality, but merely saw it as art, not knowing about the heavy baggage that it carries. This baggage, on the other hand, was what convinced a man in his mid-20s uh, to call 911 and report a vandalism in progress on me. Only thing was, it was in the middle of the day. I had 200 cans behind me, ladders leaning against the wall, <laughs> boombox blasting music while being filmed by two security cameras on the wall that I was painting. <laughs> and to this day, I don't understand if this guy, who turned out to be a university student, really thought that that was the way illegal graffiti happens. <laughs> But with a great variety of passionate views comes the great potential to communicate and interest many people as well. The spray can lends itself perfectly as an art educational tool. There's a draw, a certain fascination that I think most of us have felt before. Uh, it is the artwork of kids, and kids feel a special affinity towards it because it is their art form, and graffiti is the only art form that is invented and perpetuated by young people and youth into a global art movement. There's no stopping a group of kids once you break out the spray cans, and Andy and I have learned out of experience to pass them out in small increments, sort of like <laughs> artistic candy to avoid chaos. <laughs> spray paint dries very fast, and it doesn't mix very well, and this makes it easy for younger kids that haven't really grasped the concept of mixing colors to maintain rich and vibrant colors in their paintings much unlike using acrylic brush paints or oil paints or watercolors that all quickly turn into a brown slush. It also can cover a lot of space quickly, and this gives kids the opportunity to do artwork that involves their entire bodies and not just their wrists. 
much unlike the usual art class, where most of the work is done in a somewhat restricted radius. The increased size also gives the kids an additional sense of accomplishment. I remember the first mural that I painted as a kid and the sense of empowerment that I felt <laughs> by its mere size. I could get this sense of accomplishment every time I walked by the wall, even years later. And this is something I feel could be especially useful for immigrant kids to give them a sense of belonging and an impact in their new communities. Spray paint can be used in a great variety of ways, from the simple planet techniques that the guys in New York use on the street corners, to simple stencils or freehand images of varying degrees of intricacy, everything from simple geometric forms to photorealism, or from kitsch to fine art as possible with a spray can. And because of this vast variety, uh, custom-tailored workshops can be created that precisely fit the skill level or the age group of the participants, as well as their specific interests. In general, spray painting turns into an outing very quickly because it involves larger surfaces. So the moving of spray cans and ladders and tarps and buckets and rollers and all kinds of stuff, all and, and as well as dealing with this oversized art piece, obviously, all raise the anticipation as well as the appreciation of the final art piece. It, everybody that painted murals in this way knows that the constant up and down on ladders and the bending down to the floor to pick up paint and all this moving of heavy equipment on this large scale can be physically exhausting. And in this way, aerosol art is an interesting mix between work and creativity. And because of this proximity to the work-related aspects of mural painting, certain life skills that are needed in the completion of such a project, such as math for the measuring of dimensions and their transfer at a different dimension, uh, or the calculation of materials and budgets, trade skills for the construction or the preparation of the walls or surfaces to be painted, or social skills that are needed in dealing respectfully and professionally with the fellow participants, artists, community groups, staff, all can be addressed with the participants and give them a wide range of life skill insights that they can use further down the road. Additionally, spray painting is oftentimes a collaborative or a group effort that seeks to find the perfect balance between finding one's own individual voice and supporting the mission of the group at the same time. Very importantly, aerosol art can serve as a vehicle in the creative economy. And I don't mean the money spent on the one hand for spray paint and on the other hand for the removal of graffiti. <laughs> but rather it's power to beautify and enhance communities and give them a fresh look and making it more vibrant and, and meaningful for people to invest into them and move into them and businesses and private people. So in this sense, there's a, they can help communities financially. My friend Tasso, a well-known spray painter from Germany, initiated a yearly event called eBook and this could be roughly translated as industrial wasteland reappropriation. <laughs> a gathering of predominantly graffiti artists from all over the world in a different small community within the boundaries of former East Germany. All these little communities struggle somewhat financially, but they have these abandoned production factories from former times. The artists converge on one of these for eight days and create all kinds of site-specific art pieces, installations or interventions or huge site-specific aerosol pieces that deal with the architecture in interesting ways. <laughs> then the public is invited for a three-day opening. Last year's ebook attracted 6,200 visitors in a community smaller than Brunswick. They all ate and slept and spent money there, and talking to the town's baker when I participated, the ebook had become a cultural highlight and a highly profitable one at that for the community. One could sense this appreciation from the public by them and businesses bringing all kinds of food and presents and, and all kinds of drinks and materials during the week of construction. Once they become comfortable with these curious artist types invading their community, they started to offer up their houses as well to be painted, taking advantage of these well-known artists being present. So in this sense, I hope that these pieces, which were collaborative and more importantly, a multi-generational art piece, uh, aerosol art piece, between senior citizens from Thornton Oaks here in Brunswick and students from Vallo and uh, Bowdoin College students, as well as with a lot of support from Frontier and uh, Treehouse Institute, helped to inject a little bit of that glue into this community. It is really important to remember that it is much less about a refined end result and much more about discovering for ourselves the power that aerosol art has to create a, a social fabric, 
by weaving community, education, and creativity into a tight-knit singular unit. And this is something that aerosol art, based on its collaborative and public, as well as its artistic characteristics, inherently does. Thank you very much. Thank you.